we consider Paul's letter to the Corinthians, and he's saying that there are factions. Now he's speaking to Christians, and he's saying that there are factions, things that are dividing us. And whereas we think about Christians, even the Catholic Church, we can hardly believe that there were such divisions even back then. So what is it that unites us? It's the gospel. The people who are in darkness have seen a great light. I think of this uh, reading from Isaiah and then of course repeated in the Gospel of Matthew. And I don't know whether you know it or not, uh, but we received word we have a bishop uh, just this week. So the people in darkness have seen a great light and this is good for us. Uh, his name is Ronald Gaynor and he is the Bishop of Lexington, Kentucky currently, um, but he was from Pottstown originally. And already I wrote him a note this week and uh, one of my staff came up to me later and said, are you sure you want to send this to him? Because I had uh, addressed it to Donald Gaynor. So already, you know, I would have been in Siberia this time next week probably, <laughs> which might not be too bad seeing as how cold it is here. But in any case, uh, we have to offer great thanksgiving to Almighty God for granting us a shepherd. And so we look forward in the days ahead to see uh, how he'll find his place in our diocese. When I say that the gospel unites us, the people in darkness have seen a great light. And certainly Jesus is the light. One of the first times we see this light is over there on that big paschal candle. That's at our baptism. And at our baptism, we are given a candle to remind us that Jesus is the light. And we could light this church filled with candles from the original, and the original flame is never diminished. It represents Christ as the light of the world. And as long as Christ is that font within us, and we give it freely, it is never diminished. It is a font within us. And so I thought about this as I go back to the original formulary for baptism and the right, and it begins in this way, speaking to the parents. You have asked to have your child baptized. In doing so, you are accepting the responsibility of training them in the practice of the faith. It will be your duty to bring them up to keep God's commandments as Christ taught us by loving God and our neighbor. Do you clearly understand what you are undertaking? And the answer is not yes, the answer is we do. Do is an action word. We do, and we will do. At the end of the rite, it actually gives a special blessing to the parents. And part of the blessing for the Father says, God is the giver of all life, human and divine. May he bless the father of this child. He and his wife will be the first teachers of their child in the ways of the faith. May they also be the best of teachers, bearing witness to the faith by what they say and do in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so this baptismal rite begins with, we do. And it ends with saying, in all you do. It is an action word. And I, I bring this up because to, this week we celebrate Catholic Schools Week. But I think it also has to do with Catholic education in general. And we're all called to be educators. As the rite says, we should be the best teachers, the first teachers of our children in the ways of the faith. And I think sometimes we forget that. They, they come off as more mature than they are and we forget that we have to form them. Uh, the other day I went to visit my nieces and nephews at my sister's house. And my one niece, Sophia, walked in the door and I said, well, good afternoon, Cupcake. And she said, I'm not a cupcake. It's been a bad day. <laughs> I thought, oh, well, so I tried to be consoled. Well, what happened? What can I do for you? Well, Eliana had a piece of gum on the bus, and she only gave me a small piece of the gum. And I said, well, honey, honey, she's bigger than you are. She needs more gum than you need. And she looked at me and she said, I'm not stupid and walked into the next room. Now she's four, okay? Today I'm in my office and all of a sudden her picture fell off the wall. So I think there might be something more there too. I didn't tell my sister yet, but you know, 
something spiritual going on there. But for a four-year-old and having that response, you know, don't patronize me. I'm not stupid. And then I felt stupid for even saying that. We begin to treat them as though they are adults and as though they can make decisions for themselves. And yes, they can decide whether they want the blue socks or the red socks, but some other decisions are very important. For instance, we do force them to go to school. And if I ask for a show of hands, which I will not, of how many of them actually would want to stay home from school if they could, I think it would be overwhelming. I mean, you hear the screaming and yelling on a snow day, you know? So probably 99%, if not 100% of them, would never go to school if we didn't force them to do that. And they can give us a number of reasons why they shouldn't have to go to school. And yet, when they are in their 20s or before, we want them to be employable. And so we realize, I'm going to put up with the fighting now and the talking back and the ugly face, whatever they want to do, and they are going to go to school because one day they will need this. I realize the value of this. That we make them go to practice. And I would even say some of our athletes... Uh, if they had their choice, they'd never go to practice. They'd go to the games, but they wouldn't go to practice. Who likes practice? Who likes weight training? Who likes all that stuff? And yet, when they get out on the court or the field, we don't want them to look like they don't know what they're doing. Or, you know, we don't want them to take the whole team down with them. We want them to develop as much as they can. And they may not like it. But we realize in the long run, at the very least, we don't want them to look bad. So they need to practice and they need to hone their skills. But when it comes to the practice of the faith sometimes, that's another battle and we have to choose our battles. But that is the battle. It really is. Because if we are not raising our children with faith, then we're raising them with a philosophy. And philosophy is limited to this world pretty much. Even if you're talking metaphysics, it's, it's relegated to this world. It's existential. It's what we know through our experience. And, and you know, if it exists, we experience it, taste, touch, smell, etc., etc. And the problem with the philosophy is there is no objective philosophy, which means my philosophy is just as good as yours which means then that everything is relative. Because there is no objective truth in philosophy, then if we raise our child with a simple philosophy, it's never going to be something that they cannot deny. Because where did it come from? Well, it came from the majority rule, or it came from a social contract. We just decided this is best for everyone. But it really boils down to relativity. Everything becomes relative, and everything is really okay. Talk to somebody who is an atheist, or self-proclaimed atheist, who does not believe in anything beyond what they can sense. Nothing beyond this world. And you would have to ask them, well, what is good and evil then? If you say there is no good and evil, how do you live? And they would honestly have to say, well, I can't live by what I believe. I can't live by this philosophy. Otherwise, we're equal to the animals, pretty much. We have no more worth than they have. And I love my daughter, or I love my son. And so, we can have a philosophy that guides our life, but in the end, it just becomes relative. It's whatever I think is best, it's my preference. And my child could easily come to me and say, where is this coming from? It's just your preference. Well, this is my preference. I want to do something else. But if we look at our faith, something that is beyond what our fingers can touch or change or modify, it's an objective truth, then we also have to suffer to live by it. And we also have to act in ways that we might not want to all the time because we live by a higher power. And when it comes to the time when they're in their life and they might reach one of these deep canyons and the shadows are overwhelming and, and they can't seem to find a way out, philosophy is just going to lead them in circles. Ask St. Augustine, because he spent 28 years just trying to sift through those things.
Philosophy will always leave us floundering. But faith, even when it's difficult, and faith, even when it's hard to follow, and faith, even when we struggle with it, will always lead us to the one from whence we came. And that is why we value Catholic education so much. So whether we're in the Catholic school. Now I was raised in Catholic school, 12 years of Catholic school. I met my first girlfriend in first grade. Now the relationship didn't last that long, probably because she didn't know she was my girlfriend at the time. And usually that's one of the qualifications. But we met each other because we were on the floor using our rulers to scrape the carpet clean at the end of the day. This is what we did. I remember Sister Pius going over and banging on the radiator to get it to work. And then it would start banging on its own after that, you know. And, and it was hot as Hades in the wintertime with all this steam heat. And, you know, we didn't have the iPads. We didn't even have computers in our school at that time. We didn't have all this technology. And yet, if you look through the history of Catholic education, they are some of the movers and shakers in our world, even if they still don't practice the faith. You know, we had some tragedies. Uh, when I was in grade school, we had a student who died. He had cancer. And he was one of the older students, so I didn't really know him that much. But I know what we did. We went to Mass, and we celebrated that. And we grieved through that, through our faith. We could do that. It wasn't that we were just subjected to whatever religious assembly or whatever funeral thing that they had prepared. We were Catholic. And that's what we did whether we were Catholic or not. We went to church. That we went to Mass every week. It was a part of what we did. And the pastor usually would bring out some kind of toys or something else uh, that he could engage us to try to break down the faith for us. We look forward to that. He would come into our classrooms and we always knew when he was in the school because we could smell his cigar. Yes, those were the days, you know? And so even today when I smell a cigar, it brings back such fine memories for me of, of childhood. And so, yeah, we didn't have all the bells and whistles, but we had our faith. And it was a family. And you know as well as I do, you don't get to, to choose your family. Some of us wouldn't choose our families if we had that opportunity. And that's really what the Catholic school was. It was a family. You saw all the same characters coming up. It was a family. And it was one of those families where, you know, we can mess with each other, but don't you dare mess with us. We hold it together. And I would say that broadens out into the church community, too. I've noticed this especially here at St. Joan of Arc, that we have a number of kids and a number of families who are very involved in the life of the church. And they're very involved in the Mass and all the celebrations we have, but they don't go to St. Joan of Arc School. Some of them go to Hershey, some of them go to Dolphin, some of them you know, go to other high schools or grade schools in the area. Many of them are homeschooled as well. And they become an active part in this community. So when I talk about Catholic education, yes, we're celebrating Catholic education within the school system. But we need to celebrate Catholic education within the church because we are all called to educate our children. So those kids who go to public school, and I see them here all the time, and they're participating and they're praying, they are receiving a Catholic education, a good Catholic education. Those uh, children who are homeschooled, and they are here and they're participating in the life of the church, they are receiving a good Catholic education. But we have to do more. We have uh, kids here in religious education as well because they go to the public schools. An hour and a half of religious education uh, once a week can't do it. And I would say the same for our children who go to the Catholic school here. That they have class every day, religion class, five days a week, but that's not enough. That you know as well as I do, our children are not always good at listening to what we tell them to do, but they are experts at imitating us. And so they will see that lived faith. That's what we in the education community call the hidden curriculum. It's not necessarily right out there, but they see that example and they follow that example. We are called to be the light. That's why light is so important at the baptism. That's why they bring in the Paschal candle. And that's why they give the witnesses or the godparents this candle 
and they don't say, okay, once it's burned out, just put it on a shelf or put it in their memory box or whatever, that we should bring that out to remind us of our promises. So the question, why am I telling you all this? You're in church. It's like preaching to the choir. Because the reason we have Catholic education is so those that are educated go out and teach. And so that's what I'm asking you tonight to take that education seriously, that it doesn't end when we're a child. Look at what Jesus did. Jesus blessed the children and taught the adults. We kind of teach the children and bless the adults. We reversed it. And so I'm asking you to continue to educate yourself in the ways of the faith so that you might teach your children and your children's children and the children who are not here with us today, some of them in their 40s or 60s or 80s, to go beyond here. The closing of the Mass, I'll often say the Mass has ended, go forth. But the other ending could be, go forth and proclaim the Gospel of the Lord. And we do that most solemnly and most actively and most effectively with our lives.